Hi everyone, I'm Jack from Wing Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on Kahlo Kane by Karen Boyd, which is an outstanding book. I finished reading it this past uh, weekend and I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's an excellent piece of dystopic science fiction, but it stands shoulder to shoulder with its contemporary modernist novels of ideas that were produced between the 1910s and 1930s in Central Europe. And it's a very, very effective book at exploring those, those ideas around human consciousness and the, the intersection and significance of human consciousness and the individual within human society. Uh, and so it's a fantastic book. It was originally published in 1940. Uh, this publication, and I believe even the translation from David Macduff, are just a few years old. And so I think the book is growing in reading consciousness, deservedly so, because Karen Boy gives us a really fascinating work. Um, and I think what, what's most fascinating is that she achieves this incredible growth across the book. Uh, we, we start with Leo Call, who's a chemist. And so there is this clinical side to the narration at the beginning. It feels very distant. It feels very dehumanized. Um, there, there's, there's no sense of individuality in world state where they reside. And, and they don't even necessarily realize uh, that, that they've been conditioned to this dehumanized state. Uh, the way he views his wife, his children, his, you know, those around him, his colleagues. And it's, it's so clinical, it's precise. They, they seem to be the cogs in a machine that the leaders of World State view them as. But as the narration progresses, we start to see these cracks appear. We see the cracks appearing in Kyle's own character, but we see them appearing in different people around him. And those cracks reveal these, these little sparks, these little, you know, the, those, those sparks of humanity, that, that inspiration and hope that can drive the individual forward. Uh, and, and so it ends up being this incredibly hopeful book by the end, this inspirational book by the end, despite being written in, you know, in 1940 at a time when the totalitarian states were winning. You know, it, it was a time, the Battle of Britain, uh, the Spanish Civil War, the uh, wars in Asia seemed to be indicating that democracy would be a relic of the past, that individuals would be a relic of the past, and that on either side, in the aftermath of the various, uh, you know, traitorous show trials in the Soviet Union and in the horrors of the Holocaust that were underway, that there was no place for a middle ground. Uh, and yet Karen Boy managed to create this book and, and find hope, even though in her own personal life, she didn't necessarily find that hope. Um, but this, this book is fantastic. And it explores the idea that um, the warmth of humanity is almost the only answer to the alienation that can occur in any society, but particularly in a, a totalitarian society. And so there's this incredible moment towards the end. I could not answer, and from that moment on, I cannot account for what happened within me, as not the slightest part of me did anything but listen. I have the distinct notion that until that moment, I had never listened in all my life. What I had earlier called listening was in its very essence different from this. Then my ears had done their job in their place, my thoughts in theirs, my memory had registered everything in exemplary fashion, while my interest lay somewhere else. I don't know where. Now I knew nothing except what she told me. I disappeared in it, was her. Uh, and so that connection is just this, this wonderful moment in a book that has not necessarily had you know, these, these wonderful human connections. Uh, the, the descriptions of the society, do uh, call back, of course, the great we from Yevgeny Zamyatin. Uh, less Brave New World, but very much we from Yevgeny Zamyatin. Uh, and they look forward to what George Orwell will produce in 1984, uh, just a few years later. Uh, but there's the, the, at least I'm alive, in spite of all they have taken from me. And right now, I know that what I am is on the way somewhere. I have seen death's power spread out across the world in wider and wider circles, but must not life's power also have its circles, even though I haven't been able to see them? Uh, and so there is this beautiful hope that suffuses this, this short novel. Uh, so Calocaine is this, uh, is this drug developed by Leo Kahl, the chemist, that is a truth serum. And of course, there were, there were truth serums being used uh, at that time and used today at times uh, that will allow people to now have their thoughts revealed. And they, they won't be able to, you know, their, their actions have allowed people to, to be prosecuted within world state, but now their thoughts can actually be prosecuted before they commit the crime. Of course, thought crime, uh, various science fiction works that will be written later on, dig into that same idea. Um, and and Karen Boy was, was right there. She was, she was pushing right against that idea, but she does create our society that is strange and <laughs> uh, 
very you know painful to read at times. We could not talk, of course, because of the Air Force exercises, which permitted no conversation to be held out of doors, either by day or by night. At any rate, she saw my pleased expression and nodded encouragingly, though serious as always. Not until we had entered the building and the lift had taken us down to our apartment did a relative silence enclose us. The rumble of the metro which shook the walls was still sufficiently muffled for us to be able to converse unhindered, and yet we were careful to delay all talk until we were inside the apartment. Had anyone heard us talking in the lift, they would quite naturally have suspected that we were discussing matters we did not want the children or the home help to hear. And it goes on. After all, it was an obvious choice, as for technical reasons, police ears and police eyes could not be installed in the lift. Uh, and so there, there are these police ears and police eyes that are in everybody's apartments. <laughs> it kind of recalls in we the, the windows that are everywhere, and that if you let the curtains down, it means you must be hiding something. Uh, but this is a, just an outstanding book. I would encourage uh, everybody to read it, certainly if you're a fan of dystopic science fiction, but also, you know, people who enjoy those, those modernist novels, this is right in there. Um, and it's a book that I certainly hope to, to hear more people discussing in the future. Um, I learned about it from Dario over at Motley Reed, so I'll link his video in the description box, but let me know if you've read this one. I, I really enjoyed it. I had mentioned, of course, Zamya Tens We. I'll link my video in the description box about this masterpiece. Um, Brave New World it predates Kahlo Kane, um, but I, I, I think there, that Kahlo Kane feels more in the We 1984 vein than in uh, the place that Aldous Huxley wanted to go with Brave New World. Of course, um, George Orwell's essays, uh, many of which predate 1984, dig into the very same questions and, and the same historical and social um, conflicts and, and horrors that Karen Boy was experiencing. Uh, she had traveled to the Soviet Union in the 30s, and she had traveled to Nazi Germany in the 30s, where, where she saw that, you know, a, a single choice could mean one's life or death. Uh, a Tomb for Boris Davidovich from Daniel O'Keefe uh, would fall right into that line, I believe, as would uh, any any work from Victor Serge, who uh, had been part of the Russian Revolution and ultimately fled the Soviet Union and opposed uh, Stalin's totalitarianism. Unforgiving Years would be one of his works. Uh, Kurt uh, Tucholsky's Castle uh, Gripsholm seems to be a work that, that feels very uh, contemporary and close to um, Karen Boy's Collocane. In terms of the the despair and the real horror that the authors experienced. I mentioned, of course, Orwell's 1984. <laughs> um, I don't know that, I, I don't see too much of an influence on Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, though this is so commonly grouped with those other works. Uh, Thurston Veblen, I think, feel, feels a little bit of an influence. Um, ideas like the leisure class, uh, the theory of the leisure class, the idea that something is is precious um, only because some people can't have it. The uh, really fascinating character of Call's wife, um, Linda, is, is and, and she has this incredible monologue towards the end of the book that recalled certain aspects of the narrator in um, Die My Love from Ariana Harwitz. The, the sense of just propped up decay that exists in Colocane, and I think to a certain extent in 1984, would recall as well um, uh, Satan Tango from Laszlo Krasno Horkai, said at the end of, um, of uh, communist, um, the communist government in Hungary in the 1980s. And then I would be remiss if I didn't mention the Minority Report from Philip K. Dick. Great story. Dick has many great, great stories. So let me know if you've read Call of Cain. Let me know if you've read any of these works, if there are other dystopic works you'd recommend. And again, I hope everybody's having a great week. Thanks.